All right. Uh, welcome. Uh, this talk is called Function Hooking for OS X and Linux. My name is Joe. Okay, so these slides are on my blog, timetobleed.com. You can go get them right now if you want to follow along. Instead of giving you guys a long intro about who I am and why I'm cool, I just want to give a shout out to uh, SoftSec for uh, getting my back during the conference because this is my first DEF CON and I didn't know anybody. And free jump ESP. And I also want to say sorry to the mom and the kids that I elbowed in the face as I was running through Caesars to get to the Apple store for an adapter. My bad. All right, so I'm not a security researcher. Um, I just have a t shirt that says security. So you can feel free to get on Twitter and call me a script kitty. I'm just Joe D'Amato. All right, so here's the problem I was running around doing Ruby consulting for a lot of shops, and I noticed the common problem amongst everybody was that their Ruby binaries, after running in memory for a long time, kind of look like that. <laughs> They're very large and slow, and people want the Ruby binaries to be small, thin and fast. But the problem is, is that most people are really lazy. They don't want to install custom patches or rebuild a Ruby binary or do anything too complicated. They just want to install some library that will allow them to figure out where the Ruby binary is leaking memory and adjust the Ruby code and then, you know, live happily ever after. So it turns out that in order to do that there's a set of function hooking techniques you can employ to make this all possible. So that's what this talk is about. This talk is about three functional hooking techniques that I researched and implemented to build a Ruby memory profiler. But since I know there's people in the audience that don't really give a shit about performance analysis and memory profilers, there's also an evil example at the end of what these things can be applied to. So just a quick note before we get rolling. There's a lot of assembly syntax in this, uh, there's a lot of assembly code in this talk and it'll all be an AT&T syntax. So I can't, sorry, I, I saw somebody, I heard somebody say, oh, I can't read the, I can't read anything other than AT&T, my bad. Um, so to actually do this we need to know a few things, right? So we need to know about the ABI for the system we're working on. The question that we need to start with though is what the fuck's an ABI? An ABI is an application binary interface. So what does an ABI actually tell us? It tells us a few things. Uh, some of the more important things for this talk are it tells us about alignment, the alignment of the program stack, data types, stuff like that. Tell us about calling convention, uh, how functions are called, where arguments live, how all that stuff works, and about object file and library formats. The great thing about the ABIs is that they form a hierarchy, kind of like this hierarchy of beards. Um, these beards all are all related in some way. They're all parts of each other, and the ABIs are the exact same way. You have the big System 5 ABI, which is like 200 pages, and then as you read it, it has sections where it says like, hey, at this point, open up your uh, architecture specific ABI and read that one. And the great thing about that is that the AMD64 ABI has a page in it where it says, hey, everything in here is true, but you also need to read everything in the i3D6 ABI. So if you actually want to understand what's going on, you need to read like 700 pages. And there's also ABIs for MIPS, ARM, PVC, and Itanium as well. But lucky for us, the x86-64 uh, calling convention on OS X is based on the System 5 AMD64 ABI. So there's some overlap, so we actually get saved a little bit. So instead of actually reading all this stuff, we can just distill it down into sort of the main things we need to actually accomplish the function hooking that I'm going to describe shortly. So the first thing we need to worry about is alignment. And all that we really care about for alignment in this talk with function hooking is that the end of the argument area before you call a function has to be aligned on a 16 byte boundary. So the way this is usually accomplished is either the compiler will generate code that never misaligns the stack or you'll see instructions like this sprinkled throughout your code that are just aligning the, the stack pointer. We also need to care about calling convention. Uh, so for calling convention all we really care about is that function arguments, wow that color is horrible, uh, function arguments live in registers left to right, uh, so first arguments in RDI, seconds in RSI, et cetera, et cetera. But that's only for integer class items. Other stuff gets passed on the stack similar to the way arguments get passed on I386 if there's any I386 hackers in the room. Registers are either caller or callee saved. And that's all we pretty much need to know about calling convention to make binary uh, patching work later. The big thing we need to know more about though is object file and library formats. And we care about two of them. The first thing we care about is ELF, the executable and linkable format. This is the format that was chosen as a standard format in the System 5 ABI for, oh uh, really? Oh hey dad. Um, sorry let me turn that off real quick. All right so the, uh, so the ELF ABI was picked as a standard for Unix and Unix like operating systems. So what does that look like? Well it kind of looks like this. You have an ELF header, you have a program header table, 
various sections, the text section, RO data section, and then you have uh, another table at the bottom. So the program header table indexes different segments. So segments contain sections. Uh, and the section header table at the bottom just indexes the sections. You can use a library like libelf to help you wander through an elf object extracting useful information. The thing to keep in mind is that executables and shared objects each have their own set of data. So the picture that we were just looking at, uh, this guy right here, this set of sections and data exists for each library your executable loads. Uh, and that will be important later and you'll see why. Um, so a couple sections that are important to know about, you have the text seg section where code lives, you have the PLT section, this is stub code that helps to resolve absolute function addresses. The got PLT, this is where absolute function addresses are stored and these are used by the PLT entries. There's also a couple of debugging sections, debug info and GNU debug link. Uh, there's two other pretty useful sections. You got the DIN sim and the DIN stir. These two sections are used for dynamic linking. So DIN sim creates a mapping between exported symbol names and offsets, and DIN stir stores the actual symbol names themselves. Uh, and in addition to those, there's two other sections, the sim tab and the stir tab. Sim tab and stir tab are actually supersets of the information in the DIN sim and the DIN stir. They include other things like local variables uh, and other symbols that aren't exported. This is useful for debugging, like if you get a backtrace and you want to know what's going on, you want to know what arguments a function takes, you'll need stuff from the stir tab and the sim tab. And there's lots of other sections like for stack unwinding and exception handling and stuff like that. Okay, so the other binary format we care about is the mock O binary format. This is the binary format used on OS X. Here's a picture of what it looks like. It's cons it starts with a header. It consists of a bunch of load commands. Load commands describe the way the binary is going to be laid out in memory. So there's a segment command. The segment command is a pretty important one. It describes how segments are going to be laid out. And much like an elf, you have segments and segments contain sections. Uh, and we're going to go through some of the sections in, in a bit. Right, so uh, the, the man page for DYLD, if you have a, a Mac box, you can check out the man page. And uh, it has a bunch of ABIs, uh, so excuse me, it has a bunch of APIs uh, for touching Mako objects. So you can iterate through the objects that are mapped into the process. You can uh, play around with them and, and do stuff, and it's pretty useful. And just like with ELF, each dilib or bundle that gets loaded has its own set of data in the picture that we saw before. So just a couple of sections. These are sort of similar to ELF, right? We have the text section. This is where code lives. Uh, there's the symbol stub section. This is just a list of jump queue instructions that are useful for runtime dynamic linking, which we're going to go we're going to go over runtime dynamic linking in a bit. So don't worry. There's going to be there's going to be a really pretty picture that'll be hard to see, but if you're looking at the slides online, uh, it'll make a lot more sense. So there's also the stub helper stub code that helps to resolve absolute function addresses, and the symbol pointer section, which just holds table entries that are referenced by the stub helpers above. Uh, the other important thing to note is that symbol tables do not live in a segment. They have their own load command, the LC sim tab load command. So this, just, this is just basically a structure that tells you, hey, at this spot in memory there's a bunch of strings and there's a bunch of mappings from these strings to offsets. And there's also a die sim tab. So a di the die sim tab in, uh, in Mako, which describes how dynamic functions work, that's actually just a list of offsets into the sim tab. So on ELF you have two separate tables. On Mako you have one table and then you have a set of indexes into that table for things that are exported. All right, so let's look at a couple tools, some useful tools for dissecting objects before we actually start writing codes. So you got NM. NM is pretty useful. It comes on OS X and Linux. You run NM on your binary. You get symbol values on the left and uh, symbol names on the right. And down the middle there's information about what type of symbol it is, whether it's a local symbol, global, undefined, whatever. Object dump is also useful. Object dump comes, uh, you can get it on Linux. If you want it for OS X, you have to go find bin utils and build it. I have no idea why it doesn't come standard. So if you just run object dump on, like, say, your Ruby binary, you get offsets on the left, opcodes, instructions, and then helpful metadata. There's also read elf. Read elf is obviously for elf objects. This comes on Linux. Uh, it outputs a huge amount of information. This is just a sort of a small screenshot of what you get. It's really, really useful. And OTool is the complement on uh, Mako, uh, uh, sorry, on OS X that will output useful information about Mako objects. We also need to talk about strip. Not that kind of strip. Uh, there's a strip binary that you can run. It will strip out whatever sections you want. You can go through stripping as many sections as, as you want out of your binary, but the problem is your binary may not actually fucking work after you do that. So you need to obviously leave the text section in. If you strip the text section you have no codes and having no codes is no fun. You also need to leave in the dynamic symbol and string tables, otherwise dynamic linking will fail. Okay, so we know enough stuff. Let's uh, start hooking some functions. So functions can be called in lots of different ways on x86. There's two really common ways. One common way is calling indirectly via a register, 
like you see on the top. So in this example, RBX would just hold the address of the function you want to call, and it'll just indirectly call the function. Or the the way on the bottom, it looks like. So when you run object dump, you'll see things like you see on the bottom, where it'll look like you're actually calling a function directly, but you're not. That's not the actual full address. It's just a 32-bit displacement. So what does that actually mean? Well, we can do an anatomy of a call instruction. And, and get a better idea of what's going on. So this is just object dump output. And as you see on the right, there's a call instruction and it has, it's calling the function a function, a underscore function. And the address that it lives at is 4363 DC. So the way that's calculated is, so an object dump, right, this is the address of this instruction. This is the call opcode E8. And then the four bytes after it are the 32 bit displacement to the function you're trying to call. The way that's actually calculated is you take, we want, we're trying to call a function, so that's at th that address 4363DC. That's calculated by taking the address of the next instruction that's going to be executed and adding it to the 32 bit displacement. Remember that x86 is a little endian, so you need to flip the bytes around before you add it. So, hooking a function is actually pretty easy, right? You can just go around overwriting all the displacements that you see and replace the displacements to call your own handler function instead. And your handler function can do whatever you want. Uh, in my case, since I'm building a memory profiler, I actually want the Ruby binary to keep working after I'm done overwriting stuff. So I'm going to do my thing and I'm also going to call the original function so that the Ruby VM could do what it was supposed to do normally. Writing the codes for this are, you know, the codes are easy, right? This is just pseudocode, so relax. But, uh, you know, you just iterate through looking at each byte. Once you find a call instruction, you just do some math and you can check if the 32-bit displacement matches the function that you're trying to hook, and if it does, you just overwrite that to call your handler function instead, right? I mean, it, like, how hard could it possibly be? Well, it turns out that it's actually a little more tricky than just that, uh, so you need to be kind of careful. When you're dealing with the 32-bit displacement, overwriting an existing call with another call, um, that's fine, right? Like, the stack will already be aligned because we were, we were going to call a function anyway, and we're just going to overwrite with a different call, so alignment's fine, the registers are all fine, everything's good to go, everybody's cool. But the problem is we can't redirect to code that's outside of the instruction pointer plus the 32-bit displacement because we can only put in a 32-bit displacement. So if you're redirecting to code that's far away, you get fucked. The only way to get around this is to scan the address space searching for a free slot where you can mmap a page in to put in a bunch of code to call. So that, that's how you get around that. You basically just scan the address space calling mmap within that uh, instruction pointer plus 32-bit displacement window. And that works, but it doesn't work for everything. Uh, so call, if you call a function that's exported by a dynamic library, that works slightly differently. So we need to talk a little bit about how runtime dynamic linking actually works. So I'm going to describe how it works on ELF, but it works almost identically on Mach O. And I'm going to have a pretty picture soon that's going to show the difference between ELF and Mach O. The code is exactly the same, it's just the instructions are rearranged slightly. So here's a call instruction calling a function that has a, a function that's exported. So if you look at the top, you can see over there on the far right, it'll, uh, it says, you know, RB new object at PLT. RB new object is just some function in the Ruby VM. And at PLT, that's object dumps, object dump is telling us, hey, you're not actually calling that function specifically, you're calling this like dynamic linking thing that's going to go find it and actually execute it later. So if we disassemble instructions starting at that address, you see there's three instructions that come up. There's a jump, a push, and a jump. The first jump is referring to an address that exists, that address lives in the got PLT section. That is actually an entry in a table. That entry initially points at the address of the push instruction. Okay, so I'm going to say that again because the first time I saw this, I, had, I didn't understand why that was. So initially when you first execute your, your binary, before this, function is before this function is called for the first time, the initial state of the system is that you have a jump instruction that's jumping to an address stored in a table the address stored in the table points at the push instruction that comes right after the jump, okay? Now the reason why that is is because after you execute that jump and you land right there on that push instruction, you execute the push instruction which puts an ID on the stack and then it invokes the runtime dynamic linker. Runtime dynamic linker goes and it runs around and it finds the function you wanted to call using the ID that was pushed. It then goes back to the table and fills in the address of the function in the table. That way, subsequent calls to the same function will just land you in that function directly instead of landing you back at that push instruction. Did that make sense? Is everybody cool with that? All right, word. Um, so hooking that is actually really easy, right? We can just pretend that we're the dynamic linker and go around poisoning other people's global offset table entries. So we just redirect execution by cruising around, finding other people's PLT entries and just overwriting them with the address that we care about. 
So how that would work, here's an example, right? You have this thing, you, you're calling RB new object, uh, the table entry.